All right, it is two minutes past the hour. So I think we will kick off and if people join um, a little bit later, then, then that's totally fine. Um, welcome everyone to Out Talks. This is um, a webinar series by Outright Action International, which we've been running for almost a year now, um, featuring a whole variety of different topics. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We hope you'll join us again. If you're joining us for the fifth or 10th time, welcome back and thanks for, th thanks for, for joining us on a regular basis. Um, this webinar was actually originally scheduled about a month ago, but for various reasons we had to reschedule it, but I had this great plan of talking about Valentine's Day at the time. Um, so I'm just going to say it anyway, because you know it was last, it was last month, it's fine, I can, I can still use that, right? So um, last, uh, around this time, last month was Valentine's Day, and so you know it's a day of cel celebrating romantic love. And yet, when you look around the sort of the billboards and the 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 magazines and all of the the different um, promotions of this day, how many times um, would you actually see reflections of same sex love? I mean, it's 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 increasing for sure, but not really that often. Um, and the question that we want to address today for for this webinar links to the bigger question of in how many places can same sex love be recognized legally overall? And it's really not that many. In fact, there's only around 30 countries um, in which partners of the same sex can get married and an additional 15 or so where civil partnership is possible. That number has definitely been on the rise in recent years, but it is well below the uh, number of countries which continue to criminalize same sex relations. And that number is um, around 67, depending on how you count it. So every year, the number of countries that recognize same-sex partnership in some sort of form increases, but that's not without opposition. At the same time, opposition is, is also on the rise. Um, in many cases, using same-sex marriage or the potential of same-sex marriage to paint a kind of existential threat posed by LGBTQ people supposedly um, uh, against societies as a whole. As an extreme example, in, in 2019, the High Court in Kenya ruled to maintain colonial criminalization laws um, arguing that, de that decriminalizing um, same-sex activity would um, lead to same-sex marriage. So the opposition is also on the rise. Um, well, at the same time, fighting for the recognition of, of our relationships is core to the LGBTIQ movement. So that's why we wanted to reflect this topic in, um, in what I hope will be the first of a series of webinars looking at this in various parts of the world. Today, we're kicking off with Europe, which is where the first same-sex partnership bills were were recognized in, in 1989 in, in Denmark with the first civil partnership bill and then later uh, with the Netherlands being the first to recognize same-sex marriage. Today we'll be zooming in on three countries, um, Montenegro, Latvia and Switzerland, um, to see developments there. Um, this webinar is scheduled for an hour of which we have 55 minutes left. So we'll have a discussion with the panelists for around 40 to 45 minutes. Um, and we'll leave at least 15 minutes at the end for questions from you, which we will take um, from the chat. The webinar is being recorded, but it's only recording uh, the speakers. So for those of you who are in attendance, uh, you don't need to worry about that. And the reason why we do this is because there's always more people that register who are unable to attend for whatever reason, and then we're able to send the recording to them. So that's why we, um, that's why we do that. Before um, I dive into questions, um, I'd like to, oh, I should probably introduce who I am because otherwise I've just been this random person talking at you. Uh, I'm Dinah, I'm the Senior Communications Manager at Outright Action International and I'll be facilitating today's conversation. And before we dive into um, questions for this panel, I'd like to give each of our panelists about 30 seconds to do a quick introduction um, of who you are and where you're calling in from. And we'll start with you, Maria, because you're right next to me on the screen. Yes, so thank you, Daniel. Thank you for organizing and outright for inviting me. My name is Maria von Kennel and I'm the general manager of the Swiss Rainbow Families Association. So our focus is on public space for same-sex parents or so-called rainbow families. Thank you, Maria. Really nice to have you with us today. Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Daniel um, Kalezic. I'm coming from uh, organization Queer Montenegro, which is established uh, eight years ago, and at the moment is the uh, largest grassroots LGBTI organization in the country. And we were uh, actually involved 
in, 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 in preparation and adoption of the Registry Partnership Point Montenegro. And I'm also co-chair of the regional LGBTI Association ERA, which is umbrella organization for the Western Balkans and Turkey. Thank you, Daniel. Really nice to have you with us as well. And last but certainly not least, Kaspers. Hi, yes, I'm I'm Kaspers. I'm uh, calling in from Latvia, from the organization called Mosaica. So as we were speaking before, exactly to uh, this day, we were established 15 years ago. So we are the, the, the largest and the oldest organization and it's an advocacy organization and it's, it's a, as well as social, uh, social services organization. So we try to cover it, uh, cover it all. So, and I'm also the person that works um, with e, the cohabitation bill in Latvia. Thank you, Kaspers. Welcome and um, happy 15th birthday to Mosaica. Thank you for taking the time to join us while, while your colleagues are already celebrating this anniversary. So the reason why we picked um, Switzerland, Latvia and Montenegro, I mean, it might, it might seem like a random collection of countries, but every single one of these countries has some developments relating to recognition of same-sex partnership. And so we, and, and also every one of them has a degree of um, opposition to the progress that has been made. Um, and so we wanted, um, I'd like to start actually with updates um, on what is happening before we dive, dive into some questions about um, opposition and where that stems from and, and, and potentially some strategies for, for overcoming those. And Maria, I'd like to start with you. Was, um, at the end of, you know, in Switzerland, um, same-sex partnership has been possible since I think it's 2005 or so. And at the end of last year, international media blew up with this great news that Switzerland has finally become, you know, joined the, the group of countries that also recognize same-sex mar same marriage. But yet that those headlines were a little bit premature um, as, uh, as there has been opposition and a referendum has been proposed challenging that legislation and taking it to a public vote. So could you give us a a short few minute up to kind of top line update of, of where things stand now. What is it looking like? What's the situation with the referendum as well? Yes, with pleasure. Before I start, I just want to spotlight a little bit the history of how we came at the moment where, which we are. And it took us almost 100 years. So thank you for all these people which have been going through all these struggles for at this moment, which we are standing right now. And at this moment, we are expecting till the 10th of April, because then the three committees, which are the postponed group, which are trying to challenging and to launch the referendum, it's, they will need to collect 50,000 signatures. And so far at this moment, what we, we have heard about the media, they are now in the level of 30,000. So there's a clear sign which we can observe that the population are in favor in Switzerland for saying yes for marriage equality. But, and this is now the but, the challenging which we are thinking, which will be taking in this all sentence of, of discussion will be the definition of family. So there will be some challenges if they succeed to get the 50,000 um, signatures. So we are sure that there will be three different levels of rhetoric of first who is who should be be able to marry it and focus on concerning men women children the second the best interest of a child so that will mean to to clearly forbid um, same sex couples to get access to sperm donation and the third that there is a need for the population to vote because the definition of marriage equality is a long-term dedicated 
um, definition between men, women, and child. And as a direct democracy country, they, when it comes on social acceptance or social change, they mostly people, even if they are not against um, same sex um, couples or marriage, they will be more likely to see that the population will vote for it. So multiple layers at play there. Interesting, I find it really interesting that you zoned in on, on uh, that you specifically highlighted the key to the discussion is the definition of family. That is also key to the discussion in what's happening in Latvia right now. So Kaspers, I'm gonna jump over to you. At the end of last year, there was also good news from Latvia when in November, the constitutional court ruled that the constitution sets an obligation on the state to protect the family, including families of same-sex partners. So firmly opening the door for recognizing same-sex partnership, which Latvia does not recognize. Latvia is one of few countries in, in, um, in Europe that has no recognition for same-sex couples. And once this, once this ruling came out, a specific party in Latvia then decided, then proposed to, okay, then, so then we'll change the definition of the family. So what's happening, what's happening in Latvia right now? It's um, one thing I can uh, say for sure that the, uh, the existing COVID situation is not helping anything because people are becoming angry and that goes as well to the politicians and uh, they start doing crazy things. So, so yeah. The constitutional uh, court made a judgment providing ten, uh, stating that also a same sex, um, uh, the partner from a same sex uh, couple is also entitled to 10 day uh, parental leave, the same as the fathers, as, as, uh, as it states in the, uh, in the books at the moment. So, yes, National Alliance just right after, uh, just right after the judgment or let's say in the beginning of this year, have um, proposed an amendment to the constitution stating that uh, not only marriage as Latvia has um, the constitution states that marriage is a union between man and a woman. So, but also a family is a, a union between man and a woman and that the parents are only a father and mother. So we go even further on uh, to, to the level. So, and uh, this made us uh, uh, quite worrying. And uh, at the moment, the amendments are into the uh, discussion in the parliament. So in a parliamentary committee. So we, at the moment, we are as well working very hard in order to make sure that this does not go through because uh, as, uh, description or annotation from the National Alliance, it clearly states that it's discrimination. And, and, the, and what we're trying to say that the European Union, as we're a member of the European Union, is, it clearly states that discrimination is not allowed. So, and we go, we breach the, the basic values of, uh, of the European Union. And especially at this moment is just right Right now, the European Union, European Parliament adopted the, the LGBT freedom zone, stating that uh, European Union is the free area for LGBT, but that a couple of governments and including the Latvian government is trying to go backwards and uh, try to protect or limit, directly limit the rights of LGBT people. Is it just one party that's proposing these changes to the constitution to define a family as, as a man and a woman and their children? So it, it is a, a nationalist party. So that is proposing it. So, and they are pointing out that this is a, a, a conservative values. And because of this rhetoric, uh, the other conservative parties need to follow it. So they cannot say, you know, we're not that conservative. Even they might not going to be that nationalist, but they're still conservative. And now we're trying to kind of reshape the rhetorics that, you know, protecting family and protecting uh, people, protecting from discrimination is also an actually a conservative value. It's because it's just a, uh, it's a, it's a basic human rights, which is most most of the political political uh, ideas are also based for but uh, but yeah it's it's nationalist and it's some of the populists as well so okay. the populism as we is growing 
Um, we'll dive into that a little bit um, later on, the sort of po populistic aspects of opposing LGBTIQ rights and, and um, equal marriage and partnership specifically. Um, I just want to jump over to you, Daniel, for an update on what's happening in Montenegro. So Montenegro, also good news in Montenegro last year with, with Montenegro in, becoming the first EU accession country um, in the summer of 2020 to pass, to recognize same-sex unions. Um, which was a great celebration. I remember seeing your Instagram feed of, of your, your riding through the streets of Bogorica with rainbow flags on your cars. It looked amazing. And then um, since since then, there's of course there's been a, a government change in Montenegro with more conservative, far more conservative forces coming in, putting all of the progress that's been achieved over the last few years at risk. So could you speak a little bit? To that, what is is the partnership legislation one of the things that the new government is targeting? Are they still kind of keeping it um, under under the radar? Is the law being implemented? What does it look like at the moment? Yeah. So um, as you said, the law is adopted last July, in July last year, but law will take into force on July 15 this year. So uh, in the meantime, we had. Uh, uh, changing of the government. So after uh, 30 years of the same government, uh, 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 the new one actually won elections, but uh, uh, so changing of the government was something that we need as a society because that's part of the democracy. But what actually happened is that uh, 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 the oppositional political alliance uh, that was led and financed and supported by the church and by the Russian actually won the elections. So now we are having the situation that uh, prime minister and most of the ministers are actually elected by the church and negotiations about the, 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 the names of the of the of the uh, 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 people who will run the new government uh, who happened actually inside the church inside the building of the one of the churches. So uh, I'm telling you this just to 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 be able to imagine what actually happened. And uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, Orthodox Church and Serbian Orthodox Church, we are talking about church that is not supportive to our human rights and uh, uh, about political structures connected with that church that are uh, not so pro-Western values oriented or pro-human rights oriented. So we get into, uh, we were really depressed at the very first uh, uh, moment because we uh, were afraid that maybe they will uh, vote in the parliament to repeal the law or that they will obstruct the implementation of the law. Uh, but uh, I believe that during the last two months, we as a civil society managed to um, at least get to the point that uh, we are sure that this government will not repeal the law and that this government will actually basically work on prepare, prepare preparation of the conditions for implementation of the law and how we did it. We, we set together uh, uh, most of the uh, civil society organizations uh, and not all, uh, organizations who are were representing our community, LGBTI community. We, we set together with organizations representing uh, different communities from, from Montenegro that uh, uh, might be in danger because of this uh, uh, new uh, uh, political situation. So, um, and organizations that we are working with for years now. So basically we, we created together uh, one document called Joint Action Platform. So uh, that was, um, or that is uh, a minimum of requests from our communities to the new government. And we organized the, the, the round table with uh, uh, support of the international community of the legation of European Union to Montenegro and uh, uh, other uh, 
uh, uh, important stakeholders, international stakeholders who are active in Montenegro, including uh, uh, embassies, uh, US embassy, British embassy, embassy of the Netherlands and some other uh, 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 international stakeholders. You're, bring, you're bringing in ally, you're bringing in a lot of allies. Yeah. Let me, let me just interrupt you for a second because yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about the strategies for, for passing laws like this, and in your case, protecting them mm -hmm. a little bit later on. But what I did want to jump on is what you talked, it was, it was where you mentioned opposition. So you mentioned um, a couple of things that stood out. So one was okay. political, so there prior to the government change last year, there was political will for progress for LGBTIQ people. Absolutely. Very different to what's happening in Latvia, right? Um, yeah. But what you also what you also mentioned is that the opposite that a strong opposition comes in from the church. So what I want to zone in on now is about that opposition. Mm -hmm. So Kaspars, you talked about an opposition coming from political forces, and and I actually want you to talk a little bit about public support because that exists in Latvia quite strongly these days. Maria, you also talked about both kind of political opposition, but also public support. And Daniel, you talked about the church. So I would, let's jump to, um, Kaspar, let's jump to you first. So, op so opposition to recognizing LGBTQ rights more broadly, but specifically in, for the purpose of this conversation, um, same-sex partnership is political and, and specifically specific par parties, right? When it comes to, pol to the public, Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. So the op where does the opposition come from and what the situation looks like for public support? Because that's Latvia has a really cool story to tell actually in terms of the growth of public support over the last 15 years. Um, yeah, so not, not only 15 years, it's like we have to, uh, have to say that uh, talk about same-sex partnerships in Latvia are already uh, what, when we're saying for 24 years, it's like, and a lot of our politicians are always saying, it's like, we still need to discuss the, these issues. And we said, it's like, come on, we, we've been speaking for 24 years and it's like still, uh, we still need to talk about it. But, uh, but yeah, one side is an opposite, uh, one is political op opposition that is uh, clear and very visible. Uh, the same, I have to, I have to agree with everyone because this is a, this is a very, this is the same p pattern because as well the the church is uh, is very much involved uh, with an entire process in Latvia that that is a, a very interesting situation that the Protestant or we have from the Protestant uh, churches we have the Lutheran Church which is very against um, uh, against same-sex partnerships which we see country like for example in Sweden or in Germany. So, so we do have the religious movement, and as well, what we see, it's like uh, recently, is also an evangelical movement that have uh, previously been very, uh, very linked with uh, some of the American evangelicals uh, vis visiting Latvia and visiting Europe, and as well, including Uganda. So these people and these populists have uh, kind of came back to that from the ashes, which makes us very much worried about. But, uh, but yeah, nobody, uh, one, one thing is that as well, the politicians, but the public is, is slightly different. And our cohabitation bill is open for everyone. It's not just for the same sex people. We believe it's, it's open for everyone who do not want to engage into marriage or cannot engage into marriage. And yeah, it's like um, our po uh, uh, social opinion polls show that um, we grow up to 62% uh, in support of, uh, of the broader definition of the family and in supporting the cohabitation bill. So when we look at the age of, 50, uh, of 18 to 65, it's 55%, which is, which is a massive number. But when we narrow it down, just to, uh, if, if it would be just for the same-sex people, uh, same-sex couples, then it goes, obviously drops down. It's like, but, um, but let's look at, uh, at that. One year ago, it was 37% of people who decided that these rights should be also given to the same-sex people. Literally, what is the day today? It's like on Monday, on Monday, we got the latest polls, which say 44.5% already are willing to give it as well for the uh, same-sex couple. So we see this a clear number, is uh, the number is growing. We also have 23,000 signatures, which are legit signatures for the government to start working on these issues, which is a 
a huge number, and as well the movement. We have, during all of this negative attitudes towards LGBT people, uh, these political parties, one thing they they did is like they fueled obviously the high social polarization which doesn't benefit to any of the sides but what they did is actually they started they started the movement for us because people got as well angry so and as we're saying queers got angry and uh, finally the moment is that they started to move and it's not just a queer movement but it's also friends it's people that understand that it's like we need to stop this you know second class citizen attitude so so while the politicians are actually trying to bring us down uh into the stone age their people and the society is actually saying no 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 we we really want to become be a proper western country we are not the eastern europe as the whole world is looking at us but we want to be the western country so so I think it's like we're moving the right direction and every bad decision done by the done by the uh, politicians is obviously saddens us and as, as well as, uh, as as you were saying before it's kind of brings us in a depression the depression field but in the same time it moves up our community and people and our movement grows which makes us a little happier <laughs> It's quite, it's quite the paradox that you describe. So, you know, there's 23,000 signatures of all sorts of people in Latvia saying we need a co cohabitation law. I mean, I'm from, I'm from Latvia myself, so I follow this very closely too. And, you know, the, the campaign that you reference, it's just every, there's, you know, the, the number of people coming out and saying we need to recognize that families are diverse, um, not just for same-sex partners, but also you know, couples that don't want to get married. It's it's really amazing. And then you have pol political forces that are digging in their heels and being like, no, we are not, we are not doing this. Um, absolutely fascinating. Really great to hear the, the, the latest statistics that came out this week. Um, Maria, I'd want to go next to you because um, there is a, there seems to be a mix there too. So you said, um, was it 30,000 30, signatures um, so far collected? Um, obviously a country that has more, more people than, than, than Latvia. Could you speak to what, what is the core of the, of the opposition in Switzerland? Is it, is it, does it link to any sort of religious domination as a, a denomination as it does in Montenegro and in Latvia? Is it mainly political? Is it mainly, I mean, you said before that the public is actually very overwhelmingly in favor of this. So where, where does that, where does that power stem from that is now pushing for a referendum saying, no, we don't need this? Okay, it's not an easy question, but I will try to answer. So first, there is a power, but as well a hidden power, because the church is even here behind. But the social acceptance is so high that you can see that they are strategically um, using a less hard word as, for example, in Latvia or Montenegro, but they are always there maybe not visible like other countries, but they are putting uh, power in it and money. So, but the good thing is that, for example, just to give you um, the fact that the Catholic women, there is organization of Catholic women, they do support marriage equality and they do support the excess sperm for lesbian couples. So you see there somehow that even in, in, in the Catholic church, there are very dividing positions, but the social acceptance in Switzerland has grown terrific till the registered partnership has been accepted. So our last pools, which thanks to the Swiss gay men and bisexual umbrella organization, every year is done. 82% um, of the Swiss um, population are in favor for marriage equality and for donors, sperm donor access, 72. So we are very likely that we will really get it. And the other part of opponents, which we can dedicate it, is 
the nationalist and some patriarchal still that wants to protect the marriage and wants to keep this the, the way that they are thinking family should be like. But with the other hand, it gives us strength because the other people, which, you know, like separate patchwork family, it's a big allies to rainbow families. So at this moment, we are very in, in a very comfortable situation. Um, the only thing which, which I'm... I hope it, 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 we will be able to handle will be the hate speeches which will be raised if they succeed to, with the referendum. Because then it's, um, it will be very difficult for a lot of people, but, but what makes me scared is how to make sure that the, the hate speeches don't hit too much the the LGBT community and what can we done to resilience us and make sure that all these hate speeches, which did our children will see, because um, you just have to imagine when when it becomes on elections and, and the population, they, like we saw as well with, with Ireland, they will be pushed forward the fact that the for the well-being of the children, the best is to grow up with father, mother, and that can be really hurt for our children, which for sure they will be reading the news, see the pictures on the street. And my, my children, for example, they are 12 and 14. So they, they, they will be aware about all this, eight millions of, of people in Switzerland talking about whether should we give them the human rights or not. Right, even the discussion in and of itself can be super harmful. I just want to draw attention to the numbers that you highlighted. You said 82% are in favor of, of equal marriage. That's astounding. And yet there are these silent and yes, and le more silent, less silent forces that have the power to push through a referendum or potentially, hopefully not, but potentially have a, the power to push, push through a referendum to pose the question of whether or not this is okay, that this should be done. That's absolutely insane. So we have some similarities there between Latvia and, and, and Switzerland with, with very, with strong and, and ever growing public support. And yet the opposition is still really strong. Daniel, my information might be outdated, but I remember when I, yeah. when I was working with you back when I was still um, uh, at ILGA Europe, Montenegro was kind of a paradox in a different way in that there was a very strong political support for LGBTQ rights, partly because of the pressure from the EU, but partly from, uh, from really effective organizations like yours, and yet public support was not really there. So it was almost like progress was done at the expense of public opinion. How is, is that still the case or how does it look now? Yeah, that's that's definitely still the case because uh, on the Rainbow Europe map we have sixty three percent, and now we will have more uh, uh, regarding the rights that we are having on paper. So this is for those that's, who don't know, that's a huge. Uh -huh, yeah. For those who don't know, this is a this is a tool that's produced by Elga Europe every year called the Rainbow Map, which yeah. in which it ranks countries uh, in Europe. In, in terms of the policy and legislative protections for LGB, explicitly for LGBTQ people. On this map, Montenegro is way higher than Latvia, for example. Sorry, just to interject in case um, yeah, you have people tuning you. in who, don't, who are not aware of it. Absolutely, and thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, we are, uh, I don't know which, which number, 11 or 13 or something in on the European level. Uh, uh, and that's something like, uh, uh, I don't know, more than a Spain, more than a Germany or something like that. But that's only on paper. So regarding the everyday life, regarding the freedoms that we have actually in our lives, uh, we are far, far, far away from that. So yeah, that's, um, that's a result of the uh, um, uh, years of uh, uh, reforms of the transition of the uh, European accession process 
uh, of that is also, as you said, the result of the uh, very well-organized civil society organizations that we are having, not only regarding LGBTI rights, but regarding many other uh, uh, issues, because during the last 30 years, civil society organizations were actually some kind of the opposition to, uh, to the government all the time, because we had the same government for 30 years. Uh, so civil society organizations are quite active. Uh, and um, why we do not have uh, that much changing uh, uh, within the society, uh, because we are working less than 15 years now. So 10 years ago, we didn't have any uh, uh, person from our community who is, pub for, who is publicly out. Uh, first NGOs are established also uh, uh, 10 or nine years ago. So we have a way, uh, 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 a lot of work ahead of us regarding the uh, social acceptance. Um, but we, we was using the moment during the last decades and uh, we were quite using um, um, European integration uh, process because we knew that, uh, and we know uh, at the day when we joined the EU, everything will stop. We saw that in Croatia, we saw that in some other countries uh, in the past. So we were just rushing uh, to change as much law as we can, as you can. and so to use that moment. Yeah, taking advantage, this is like a strategic decision yeah. based from, from civil society to use the pressure points at your disposal. So in Latvia, the pressure point might be public support in Switzerland as well, one of the pressure points, whereas in Montenegro, it's the accession process. That's really, I mean, that's really interesting. And of course, what you're saying is, um, is, is totally right that it takes time for people, for hearts and minds to change. And we can look at that both in, in Switzerland and in the, 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 the long timeline that Maria was holding up or, or what Kaspers was saying. Um, I mean, just just 15 years ago, there would not have been as many as many supporters of, of the partnership legislation in Latvia as there are now. Um, I, I hate that we have these webinars for only an hour because it feels like we just start talking and I have to cut everyone off to get questions from the panel from from participants, but that's kind of <laughs> that's how it happens. Um, so we sort of only give a teaser of what's going on. But before I turn to um, before I let our attendees ask some questions I wanted to end on a positive note so we have talked about opposition we have talked about challenges but all three of you have mentioned things that you have done or great achievements that that have happened that have propelled this progress forward so I'd want to go to each one of you and maybe um, maybe name one thing that you did as an organization or that you think really helped in um in achieving this progress. So I know, Daniel, you, you just talked about the accession process, but I, I know that you also did a really great campaign in advance of partnership legislation being passed last year, for example. So if we can end on those positive notes, um, and then I'll also give you a chance to, to comment or, or ask any questions of each other before we um, before we go to the participants. So Daniel, we can, we can go straight back to you, um, maybe try and keep mm -hmm. it to just about a minute so we're not um, running over time. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's a tough question, but uh, the first thing that uh, came into my mind uh, is understanding in everything that we do, understanding of the uh, needs of our communities that we are representing, understanding of the our opposition, understanding of the people that are not supporting us at the moment, understanding where it came coming from and not fighting with them but trying to you know to approach them in a way to get to know each other not to judge each other and trying a ways to connect each other uh, 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 because when we do that and when, when we find a way to do that in everything that we are doing we are actually making the change i think because um a lot of people you know uh, from the community at least in montenegro um is uh, uh in the mood i will fight with them and we are working a lot with the community to you know to learn how to put emotions sometimes 
behind and to 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 try to understand that we are also having a living beings in front of us who just don't understand most of them i'm not talking about those who are uh, 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 doing uh, uh, violence or discriminations or something but those who are just you know uh, 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 learned that we are wrong and we are here to prove them that they are actually wrong so you're talking about finding finding common trying to find common ground with people yeah. who we don't necessarily want to engage with who who we might want to um you know never see and 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 fight with but trying to find yeah. that look at look at it from a bigger picture to find common ground all right um, absolutely that is that is a I, I, that's a strategy that's definitely been used in 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 different movements for sure because uh, otherwise you're just fighting right um that's yeah. that's something that you can share um in terms of strategies or things that you have done to to propel for, uh, progress forward yeah it's uh it's, it's practically the same strategy as this like we we are speak uh, we are trying to speak uh, with the people we reshape our or reframe our rhetorics um, in in order to for, that everyone actually understands because often often we use the uh, words as human rights equality and what uh, and so on which actually people have no one like they have heard it on tv but they have no understanding what that actually means because to be honest we at the human rights movement we know what the human rights means but the person uh, on the, in the daily life they have no understanding so what, what we're trying we try to tell the story of um, of actually what that means that it is important uh, it's not just important for few people but it's uh, it's important for everyone as our um, our proposal goes uh, you know the cr uh, cross gender so it's not just same sex but it's, it's as well for opposite sex people people and it's not just for the people who love but it's also for the people who care about each other and that that's why we actually explain that you know you look around and it's literally for everyone around you you definitely know someone you are one of uh, one of the one of the people that actually this targets targets to so and yes we we speak calmly so we in the in the most possible ways we are calm at uh, whatever people are saying, we're always polite in, in our responses, even like we get the craziest stuff. And obviously the, the, biggest, the biggest strategy is advocacy. So advocacy work nonstop. So, so we are there at every place where the decision is made, like in or out, uh, looking at the window, uh, listening at the door. We're literally at every single step. Uh, step we're there uh, we talk to our decision makers we we talk to the people that we the politicians those politicians who are like-minded but uh, most of the time the politicians that are still unsure so we speak with everyone almost everyone who who um, who is ready to listen and have a conversation so so and this has brought us to you know the the cohabitation bill at the moment in Latvia is is somewhere where it has never been in these 24 years. It's it's debated in a, in two commissions at the parliament and in and in, in the Ministry of Justice. So you know it's like that wouldn't be possible like 10 years ago when when the last partnership bill was uh, was there. So constant work. It's like and um, you know they want to stop we keep on or like just let's let's make it a joke as like as as we as uh, as we recently said it's like you know if the life gives you lemons just let, let's make a lemonade it's like that's one thing that we could definitely do so and that's what we always try to do as well within our campaign and organization so you also talked about like daniel finding common ground um with people that you might not necessarily want to engage with but do you also talked about the use about language and using um, using words and concepts and stories, particularly stories, to explain things like human rights, which, as you rightly say, not everybody knows what that is. They don't, you know, to make it tangible and understandable. Um, and persistence, I think, was the last thing that you said. Maria, over to you. What would you highlight as as um, as important in your strategy? 
Yes, as a reclaiming family definition. This is what we have done 13 years ago. We challenged the National Family Organization in Switzerland. We requested membership and it took a while, you know, because like uh, Daniel said and Kaspers as well confirmed, the concept sometimes, they don't get it. So it was like a starting point of getting in as a member of the Swiss National Family Umbrella Organization. But just to make it clear, at the first time when I step in in the first meeting, I, I will never forget the, the moment because there was nobody was breathing. And it was clear the lesbian mother is in, what should we do with the lesbian mother? So it was like being there, building bridges with the with patchwork families, building with as well discriminatory um, history with other family, other family diversity. And step by step, we brought all children grandparents, parents to the parliament, talking with them, explaining why it was necessary to make sure that those children have the legal um, uh, recognition. And it was a long-term work of 10 years, but if you think of the timeline that I, I show you before, it was a great momentum and victory in 2018, which we finally uh, succeed to get the legal recognition of same-sex parenting. Two, step adoption. So it's still not from birth on, but at least it was like a very important momentum from us. So pushing the boundaries comes in there as well. Um, re reclaiming or redefining the definition of family. Um, that's really, of course, really, really important. I wanna give the opportunity to all three of you to comment on anything or reply to anything that any of the rest of you have said, because you've just been answering my questions, but I'm sure there's things that you might wanna to say to each other before I take some questions from, from our, from our um, attendees. So I can't, I really can't wait to see you all in the Ilga Europe conference. So I don't know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I truly hope that we could go somewhere. <laughs> so that is, yeah. But I, I think in general, we, we all three, and I think many organizations across the world, we share the same strategy. So it's like, we have learned from the best is like, I've seen in the questions and answers is like, Emma is talking about Ireland. It's like, we, we do less, uh, we learn from, uh, from victories. We as well, we look at, we look at the, the stories that didn't go that well. So, so that, that, that is the main thing. It's like, I think sh sh sharing is, uh, is something that, that is, that is very, imp uh, very important is like we as well, we draw a lot in common with Switzerland because, you know, across the world, the people think that Switzerland is, 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 is the, one of the most liberal countries in the world and stuff, which might not necessarily be fully true, but, uh, but so, so that that is uh, that is. But we have a lot in uh, in common in in that field, and I think it's like learning learning from each other is 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 very important. You're actually also echoing what yeah. you said at the beginning, where you said that COVID makes everything worse. So what you've said now, actually, what Maria said, is a reminder of the fact that these connections and, and time together for activists across different countries is really important, not just for the sense of community, but also for strategizing on things like this. Daniel, please. Yeah, I just want to remind all of us, especially in these terrible COVID times, that um, we have a lot of reasons to, to, to be, uh, to think in a negative way, all of us, all around the world, but uh, uh, and because of the COVID and because of the political situations and because of the rise of the radical uh, uh, and far uh, uh, right political structures. But I would just use this opportunity to remind all of us that success is 
you know, uh, 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 going up and down and up and down. And sometimes we need to go down to be able to go up and to rise. So, and sometimes it's sideways. Something that I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes absolutely it's sideways too yeah there's no that's absolutely right there's no one there's no one way for progress um it's it's diverse it looks different there's things that we learn from each other there's there's mistakes of each other's that we learn from um yeah and it's it's not always a, a linear uh, linear progress thank you for that positive note um we're we've got about eight minutes left so there's not too much time for questions i see a few of them i'm i apologize i will in advance i will not be able to take all of them i'm going to pick a few that i think relate most to the conversation we've had i see com i see questions about um other priorities of, of lgbtq organizations and and um and things to fight for and i won't take those um just because we don't have enough time to address them so i'll i'll stick to specifically questions that relate to same-sex partnership or marriage um there's a question that i see from emma that talks about um uh, how these how marriage equality or or partnership issues are covered in the media in each of your three countries um emma says i'm watching from ireland and our referendum coverage always seems to demand equal allocation of airtime to both sides of debates this actually links to maria what you were saying about amplification of, of of hate speech if a referendum is to come about so maybe we can start maria maybe we start with you how does how does the how is the media representing what's happening with um with progress for marriage so we are very lucky in, in this point of view because the media is, is very supportive. So it will take as well the opponents, but in, in the sentence so far, it's, it's um, very positively. That's wonderful to hear. Daniel, what about in Montenegro? How, how is the media representing LGBTQ issues and um, partnership legislation specifically? Uh, uh, surprisingly good. So there, the, the note is uh, quite positive. We are doing media monitoring uh, uh, every year. So we have only one uh, uh, internet uh, uh, portal that is um, uh, not supportive. Others are uh, neutral or uh, um, positive. So we are lucky regarding the media. We are really, really lucky. Kaspers, what about Latvia? Uh, I believe Latvian media in gen uh, general is uh, either neutral or either positive uh, on things. It's like if we look at the public broadcaster, the public broadcaster is neutral and they, they take the stance, which is uh, completely understandable. And then when we look on the uh, this mainstream news services, that it goes more into the positive, uh, into the positive side. And I have to admit that... Um, you were just saying about supporting from support from the media in um, in January we had uh, while these amendments to the constitution took uh, took place when the debate took place so we had uh, a frame on Facebook which is in Latvian said protect all families and we had two um, two large scale news portals have actually transformed day Facebook picture with our frame so so which was massive and this is like the second and the third largest news portals in the country so they just transform into supporting the, the actually the movement so so that goes like even 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 step forward and and yeah a lot of media are actually engaging uh, like most of the media are engaging and requesting uh, the stories. They say it's like, give us the stories, we'll tell them. So, so that, is, that is one positive side as well. That's wonderful. I mean, it sounds like it's a reflection of progress. Of course, in many places around the world, that is not a, that is not a luxury that LGBTQ people can count on. Um, there's a question that I would ask all three of you to uh, reply in the chat box. I don't think you need to say it out loud, but Richard is asking about how many members of parliament there are in each of the countries um, and the legislatures. So if you know that off the top of your head, maybe you can type it in the chat box. Um, and I want to go to, um, we've got four minutes, so not too much time, but I want to address Alan's question about is there support from business and corporate sector in your countries? And I'm just going to amend that question to link it specifically to partnership and or marriage. So do, uh, is there corporate slash business support for progress in recognizing same-sex partnership and or marriage? This links to something that Daniel talked about at the beginning about allies. Um, Maria, maybe you go first. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was concentrated now typing. Can you can you repeat again? All right, we'll go to Daniel first. <laughs> okay, we'll sorry. go to Daniel first. But the question is about whether there's business or corporate support for okay. partnership and uh, and or equal marriage um, in Switzerland, and what role that plays. Daniel, go so ahead. So, do you want me to go? So, uh, yes. the same question is for me, right? Because I was also typing with a number of MPs. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, so um, we do not have that much of the corporate support. It's just starting in Montenegro. So we have some few international brands who are publicly supporting uh, us in the campaigning or our work, but it's uh, starting slowly. In its infancy, um, Maria, <laughs> over to you. Yes, so in Switzerland, we have already uh, some organized uh, corporate groups, but um, we will look into in deep if the, they should succeed with, with a campaign. We look into refer, um, references to human rights, if, when and how we will take money from corporates. So yes, we have a lot of interest corporate, um, organizations, but there is as well a thematic like pink bashing. I don't know if, if you are challenged by them, but we will take into very clearly human rights standards before we take any money to invest. So in Switzerland, it's at a point where there is enough support that you can be you can be very selective about which which support you you can accept um, or do accept. I think elsewhere there's you. Not always so much choice. Kaspers, what's happening in, in Latvia with corporate so, support? Yeah, with the corporate, oh, what I have to say is like with the corporate support, it's it is as well, it's uh, growing, but I have to say it's significantly growing. So it's uh, less, uh, uh, I have to say it's less of an international corporations that we were thinking about is like, you know, the, 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 the big fours that are always, you know, uh, in rainbow, but we actually see local organizations and uh, local companies are and not involved. They're not that much involved in, for example, providing us uh, uh, financial support. But for example, one company that uh, called Printful that has offices as well in in US. Um, have, have engaged in the lobby process. So they they have already they spoke out and they literally talk about each at each and every interview in Latvia in the mainstream media that it's like, no, 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 it's like we need this. It's like we need the partnership bill. It's for the it's for the people. And as well, what I see um, what I see with a couple of companies that I work, it's like, okay, they might not going to be speaking out loud at this moment, but what they do within the organization itself, they provide uh, equal rights. They provide. It's like if the state doesn't provide the equality uh, and the same rights that the company will be providing, and uh, and that is that is an important thing as well. Um, and that what we have achieved it's companies uh, companies are actually stepping way forward with their policies than a state so at the end of the day we will have to say it's like come on it's like government is like learn from uh, learn from the best and which are actually the business uh, business so sector. The, pu the public and the public and corporations and businesses are are, are leading the way in Latvia how this is exactly. so interesting and also to hear the different the differences in the three countries I feel like that could be a separate conversation in and of itself about um, the role of the role of the private sector, um, what role they can play and do play in different places. Unfortunately, we are at time. So, um, and I really do apologize for the other questions that are in um, the chat box. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them. We were just having such an in-depth conversation um, that we, we took too much time. So thank, I wanna thank um, everybody who joined us today for the call and thank you for staying. Thank you for engaging in the chat box. Most of all, I'd like to thank our panelists, Maria Kaspars and Danielle calling in from across the ocean. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're in four different countries right now and this is maybe one of the nice things about COVID that, that we can connect in this way across, across borders. 
um, this was um, yet another talk as, as part of Outright's OutTalk series. Please join us for others. I'm just going to stick in the chat where you can see um, the full schedule of upcoming talks. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy birthday to Mosaica. Daniel, keep keep fighting to. Um, oh, sorry, that's my dog growling. Um, he was spurring you on. Uh, keep fighting to protect the partnership legislation in Montenegro. And and Maria, we're all keeping fingers and toes crossed that that referendum does not come to pass. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, Thank have a you. wonderful Thank evening, you, rest of the day and week. Bye. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye